how the arrangement changes from like the studio version to the live version, you know, it's a treat for the audience. They're not taking themselves too seriously. Yes. Like there's something for the musical Michael Jordans and there's something for the musical Danny DeVito's, you yes. know? There's like more risk, there's more energy, there's more trial and error. This is one of the best bands that's playing music right yeah. now. It's a band. It's a band. It's and a it's a band. band. Hello, and welcome back to Professional Musicians React. Today we've got, okay, that's that's as much jazz as I can take uh, at before noon. Um, seriously, we got an awesome show today. We got an amazing crew of professional musicians. We're gonna do something a little bit differently today. We've been reading the comments. Folks have been asking for more Silk Sonic and also live performances. We're gonna combine those today. We're gonna do a Silk Sonic recording versus the Silk Sonic live performance and talk about the differences and similarities and, and what they're bringing. Um, we're joined by some amazing professional musicians, the one and only Adam Neely. Uh, I don't have to introduce Adam, but I'm going to. Adam is a bassist, a composer, a YouTuber, has over a million and a half subs on YouTube, um, makes the most incredible deep dive videos about anything you've ever wanted to know and far, far beyond um, with regard to music. He's uh, he's one of my favorite YouTube channels. I'm so excited to have Adam here. He's been on Vox, he's been on NPR, he's been uh, at South By, he's, you know, everywhere. Adam's, Adam's around. If you don't know him, go check out his music. And on his left, the one, the only Jacob Sesney is a saxophonist, multi instrumentalist. He's played with the Mike Posner band. He's played on American Idol and The Voice with Kanye, Kesha, Shawn Mendes, also Anderson Pack and the Free Nationals. We also got Tim Sonnefeld. Tim Sonnefeld is our engineer today, Grammy oh. award winning producer, engineer, multi instrumentalist, and arranger. And All we have an, an icebreaker question for you guys today. What is one of your favorite music collaborations? There's this, uh, was this collective of musicians in New York called the Apartment Sessions? And it would be this whole group of musicians who got together in this tiny Brooklyn apartment and played like orchestral arrangements of all these like wonderful folk and pop songs. And I, we, I got the opportunity to play with one of my favorite songwriters, Gabriel Kahane. Mm. And that, that was honestly one of my favorite collaborations with the Apartment Sessions it was like 60 people in this tiny apartment playing this beautiful music. And uh, yeah. TV sets and houses, effortless and done in fancy colors. All the writers, all the newsmen speak of. Jacob, any thoughts? Favorite musical collaboration? Yeah, um, I think the time spent with Kanye, those uh, five or six months leading up to Coachella. Because you just had this situation that you'll probably like, I'll probably won't get to do again. Yeah. You had like a 10 piece drum line of like the most amazing musicians. You know, you had, you had Kendrick's drummer, you had Bieber's drummer, and then you had like a 15 piece horn section of like all these amazing cats. And then you had a hand selected choir of like each singer was a super, you know, singer yeah. artist in their own right. So just like to have someone that can like foster that environment, it was like pretty cool and pretty wonderful. Insane. Yeah. I still have tinnitus from it. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, what about you, man? Uh, there's this amazing uh, female vocal ensemble called Sage that I've been into mm. recently. And it's these four vocalists and their first record that they ever made was nominated for a Grammy. But if you get caught within the ocean, the undertow, Okay, the first thing that comes to mind for me is uh, Nielsen Sings Newman. Do you guys know this record? No. Okay, Her Harry Nielsen, I guess, uh, went through a time uh, where he wasn't writing great or he didn't like the stuff that he was writing. And Randy Newman was writing amazing songs. So he said, I'll just do a record of this guy's songs. So it's a record where Harry Nielsen sings Randy Newman songs and it's, it's insane. This morning, I had. Let's get into it. Let's get right into it. Silk Sonic smoking out the window. So Tim, tell, yeah. tell us about the recorded version first. Um, so it was the third single from uh, their debut record, An Evening with Silk Sonic, released on November 5th, 2021. Um, it was accompanied by a music video directed by Bruno and uh, John Esperanza. Wow, Bruno directed it. Yeah. Damn. Top five Billboard Hot 100 hit. 
uh, performed for the first time at the 2021 American Music Awards. Uh, that's the video that we'll be watching here when we watch the live version. DeMille, Anderson, and Bruno wrote the song together. Uh, Bootsy Collins uh, is obviously at the vocal right at the beginning. Anderson and Bruno are on vocals throughout. Um, Bruno Mars also played percussion and guitar. DeMille plays piano and bass. Uh, Mark Franklin plays trumpet. Lanny McMillan plays tenor sax. Kirk Smothers plays alto and baritone sax. Homer Steinweiss plays drums. Cameron Whalen plays trombone. Glenn Fishbach plays cello, who's an old Philly buddy of mine. And strings were arranged by Larry Gold, a very dear friend of mine, and 215. Yes. All right, this is uh, Smoking Out the Window, Silk Sonic, Bruno Mars, Anderson Pack. Here it is. Wait a minute, this love started off so tender, so sweet. But now she got me smoking out the window. Mm. 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 <sighs> Must have spent 35, 45,000 up in Tiffany's. Oh, no. Got a badass kids running around my whole crib like it's Chuck E. Cheese. What, what do we do? Like, where do we start? <laughs> where where I to feel begin? Like I need to listen to that ten I know, more times I know. before I can talk. About I had it. the same thought. It's so thick. Okay. There's so much happening. I think the the first thing is just the vibe. It just feels it, all this music is so fun to listen to. You just feel like you're you just walked into the best party. I completely agree. E it, everything serves the vibe. Everything else just just fits. I mean, we could talk about how it's all put together and the influences that, that are drawn from all the performances, but it's just like, it's such a strong vibe. There, it hits so many tropes. Like there's so much to the vibe, the 70s vibe, yeah. that it hits so perfectly. There was like a little sitar in there, I just noticed. Yep. And I was like, oh my God, there's the some Motown, Glockenspiel? The Motown yeah. flavor, yeah. right? The Glockenspiel, <clears throat> but the, the line that the Glock is playing is this yeah. kind of like <laughs> 90s <laughs> hip hop. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Line. And with the guitar, right? Yeah. It sounds like a flute almost. Yeah. I always thought it was a flute. Well, on the 90s hip hop vibe, it, it starts with the, the Pharrell, duck, two, yeah. three, Four, and then in on that. Wait, can we hear the, yes. let's hear the 90s yes. hip hop? Yeah, what, what is this? Smoking out the window. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and then into it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but then it's... Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is happening, which is happening throughout the whole song. Like yeah, the yeah. all like the A sections, the B sections, like that line is just sprinkled throughout there. Yeah. It's such a little hook. It's, it's such a nice little hook. Yeah. Yeah. It has such a 70s vibe, but it brings in everything that has happened since the 70s. Okay, so what 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 makes it have the 70 the 70s vibe? The snare what drum gives sound. It, the, the snare drum sound. The snare drum sound to me is 70s. Yeah, and we've talked about this before with Silk Sonic, and maybe it's just Pax like the way he plays drums you right he's playing drums on mm -hmm. this right i think sometimes both of them like you trade on, uh, it's like huh I no, wonder, uh, is actually, it say specifically who it was on that? Um, yes, it does say who uh, played drums on this, and this is not Anderson or Bruno. We got Homer Steinweiss on drums. Oh, on shit. Song. Wow. Uh, it's funny. It sounds like Pac, yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, the triplet fills. Yeah. Like, I, 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 I have that, too. Th like, that's a, such a silk sonic sound. Like, yeah. The triplet fills. So a triplet fill is when you play triplets in a fill. Instead of eighth notes, daka, daka, daka. You play triplets, da -ka da -da -ka -da -da -ka -da. and the reason why this is so cool is because most of the song is in eighth notes, and when you hear those triplets, it kind of brings you to the drums. What, are the, what is the drummer doing? Oh, they're playing triplets. It's very cool. But the, the, for me, it's the it's the miking and the recording and the mixing of the drums. Mm -hmm. um, it just 
I, I know, I know, I, I've actually, when we listen to Silk Sonic, I've said this before, so at the risk of repeating myself, it's like, it sounds like such quintessential ribbon mic drums. Yeah. I don't know if they yeah. use ribbon mics, but listen. Mm. 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 Yeah. Like, yeah. it's a dark sound. Like, yeah. the modern snare has that shh kind of thing on top. Mm. This is a like it's this kind of dry and but it's also like a very woody tone you feel like you can hear the whole snare drum you know you can yeah. hear the tail of the snare drum so the the drum sound is one of the like quintessential drum sounds what things. else what makes it feel 70s the p bass baby the p bass yeah like the, the playing. Oh, what, what do you mean the p i mean what, yeah okay, what so is, the sound and the playing right the sound and the playing the fact that it's probably flat wounds that uh, is happening like there's so many like little specific fills there's one at the, coming out of the second what makes it sound like flat wounds just how dark it is yeah so this this p bass has flat wounds on it right now and there's two kinds of bass strings we got flat wounds and you got round wounds and round wounds are more modern they have the zing they have that kind of like bright upper upper top like you know, kind of i guess the difference between ribbon mics and like condensers mm. Uh, flat wounds are good for this style because that's usually that is how bass strings used to be made. They were all flat wounds. They didn't have like that top end, and so there's this kind of like punchy, like burpy sound, I guess, to it. Like this bass has that you wouldn't have from like a modern active bass. Like you know, if I did slap on this bass, it wouldn't have that modern. Give us a give us a little taste. Yeah. <laughs> Which sounds more like Larry Graham than it does Victor Wooten, for example. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't have Flea. that '80s sheen to it. It has the the '70s darkness. And what about yeah. the playing? Makes it feel like '70s. Well, I think it's a, a combination of like staccato stuff. There was uh, a lot of the vocabulary, like second verse. There was like there's this left hand mute technique mm -hmm. that I end up doing that a lot of bass players do to kind of emulate the sound of a 70s bass because they used to put uh sponges like mm -hmm. by the bridge to get more of a muted tone mm -hmm. and so what i end up doing here is i end up kind of like laying my hand like laying my fingers across the strings to so you're muting with your left hand exactly yeah. versus and i'm hearing a lot of the muty muty stuff mm -hmm. going on here so they probably you know they probably weren't using a sponge but that that muty p bass flat wound yeah. sound is so that's a big piece of it. so tied to like the rhythm section sound okay i'm gonna here. say an obvious one chord vocabulary yes okay. agreed the major sevens yeah it's a lot of you know a lot of this this kind of sus 13 sound right yeah I, I imagine my guitar was in tune i'll I say did this one on more purpose. thing one more thing that makes it oops that makes it sound really 70s um the 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 beautiful freaking string arrangement that's yeah. totally buried in the mix. Larry right? Gold. Like, Larry just, Gold. Yeah. just like that's, I mean, that's such a, like when you hear those 70s records, it's like they spent like so much money on an orchestra and an arranger yeah. and players, and then they just bring it just very quietly into the mix. That is a, that is a 70s vibe. It's the salt. One, yeah. th one thing I love so much about Bruno and Anderson is that the music really, like, it's obvious to say, but it comes first, and I guess it, like, you know, Homer on drums. It's like you have Bruno, who's a wonderful drummer. You have Anders, who's a wonderful drummer. And then you have, um, you know, Bruno's drummer, who's his brother, Eric, normally. Mm -hmm. And all three of them are wonderful drummers, but they got this other guy to do the part. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, I don't need to be playing drums. It's whoever's right for this vibe and this part. And Homer yeah. actually, like, just crushes it. Crushes it. And I think that's so cool that they're like, you know what? That's the guy who's best for a job. That's who's going to throw it down. That's such a good point. And I think that serves, like that, that's like Ryan's point at the beginning, too. Just like, it's like everything serves the song. That's another example of that kind of humility. They're just like, look, what's best for the song? Mm -hmm. Like, let's have Homer do this, and we'll do these other things. And they're just focused on, like, making the best thing possible versus like being the you know the dominant voice in the band we've talked about this before but it might be worth mentioning again which is just the idea of using uh modulation as production you know chords as production now with, with music a lot of music today the thing that sets sessions apart is the different projection elements coming in and out with these types of songs they're using key changes to make sections feel new again i think the perfect example of that is the bridge right let's listen to mm -hmm. coming out of the uh... it doesn't modulate in this one though so it gives 
I, this is something I love. Yeah. I love about this. It gives you the impression that it's going to modulate, which is kind of what happened. What's the other Silk Sonic song? Uh, yeah, uh, leave the door open. Leave the door, leave open. The door open. Yeah, <laughs> that one. That one. Yeah, it's like oh geez. Yeah, that one. That one modulates in a really like clever way, and it almost hints at it here, but it mm -hmm. doesn't because going into the chorus, the thing that goes into the chorus in this one, we hit the uh, like the. The six, the six sus, mm -hmm. right? But then we, the first chord of the chorus is uh, the four chord, which is kind of an unusual like transition mm -hmm. to go from six sus to four. So it goes at the end of the bridge from the five sus to the six sus, giving the impression that it's going to be modulating up a whole mm -hmm. step. Like it's going to give... We're in Disney territory where you go from like the five and then you go up the five, like up a whole step, and then we're up. Which a whole is a very step. Alan Menken. <laughs> yeah. 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 Such, you're right. That's a very common modulation technique where right. you hit the five chord of the new then, key. Of the, no, no, no. You just of hit the, the five chord key. of the first yeah. key. Then you go up a half step, same chord, and everybody goes, oh, we're going to the one in the new yeah. key. But then you, but then they don't. They don't. Yeah. They, yeah. they, can we hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's hear that. Three, two, five, five, five. Here we go. Oh, yeah. oh fucking yeah. genius! It's so genius. It's just, it, I love that. It's there's so it's it's clever. It's That's subtle just like, too. Uh, yeah, it's and it's uh, the, the other thing maybe that makes it feel super old is the use of major sevens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? yeah. It's just like all Extensions. the fours are major sevens. Yeah. all the ones are major sevens, mm -hmm. and it also gives it that smooth R and B kind of vibes. You know, is yeah. the major sevens totally? It's like you can hear, you know, you can hear Barry White speaking some yeah. sweet nothings. Totally. You the, know? the talking, <laughs> yeah, right. The yes. talking. It's some Elvis, you know, kind of Barry White. Oh. The well, the happening. Yeah, the Bootsy Collins at the top. That's a cheat code. The Bootsy at the <laughs> top. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Let's let's listen to the live uh, version of the song "Smoking Out the Window" from the American Music Awards. American Music Awards. The Hooligans is the yeah. band. Okay, that's Bruno's band. Let's listen. <laughs> Different. Those shows must be so fun. Oh. I bet those shows are the funnest. That band is like the best pop band. Like it's yeah. yeah. So a couple couple questions for you guys. Yeah. You've all and, and I think maybe maybe Ryan and Jacob especially and and Adam. I know you've played a bunch of live shows too. But there's some differences that make this the better way to play it live. Yeah. Right. If you're gonna play this at an award show. And you have that original song. Why would you play it like this? They hit so much harder live. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> they're hitting so hard, and it's it's such a different sound than like it's such a different vibe because yeah. it's like the energy is so much higher. It needs to be higher for the live. I wonder if it's faster. Is it? Is it? Do you think? Huh. It might be a click or two faster. Sometimes. Okay. Some common techniques that people will use when performing things live are. Number one, things just feel, everybody's hearts are beating, right? Yep. Faster. So if you play things at record tempo at a live show, it, it feels oftentimes like feels slow. Yep. So people will speed things up, and then the drummer will, a lot of times, just be way more active. Eric was definitely, uh, Eric Hernandez, Bruno, Bruno's brother, was yeah. definitely doing some more so, choppy yeah, fills. Yeah. In there. More choppy fills. And if you go see, like, anything at the Super Bowl, at the Super Bowl anything like Adam Blackstone, there's oh, always just, like, insane chops, drummer stuff happening that people would never get away with playing on a record. <laughs> you know what I mean? But people want, it just, 
that's the fastest and most effective way to bring a shit ton of energy is just to have the drummer go crazy. Air moves differently on a stage if the drummer mm. is playing more notes. Like the way that even, you know, if, even if everybody's on ears, even if it's like all like a curated thing, if the drummer is physically moving the air differently, there's a, there's a different approach versus like, I, it would be a, such a different show if he was playing like the record. I, right. The other thing that's interesting about the way they do this is the song, the groove doesn't start for like a minute. Yeah, it's right? a lot it's of hits just, up top. Yeah, it's hits to kind of get people to want anticipation. The song. Yeah, and they, they, I think, you know, the best live shows, a lot of really great live shows, they are really good at building anticipation yes. and then release. How the arrangement changes from like the studio version to the live version, you know, it's a treat for the audience to be like, oh, mm -hmm. this is oh, it's the same song, but there's yes. a oh my god, <laughs> yes, like the chord on Chuck E. Cheese, yes, oh yeah, yeah, play that, Crash. play oh, that, oh, th this is this is one of my, oh okay, I got, what, you got to tell us about it. I What 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 did you just do? Six major seven, <laughs> baby. Six major seven. Yeah. yeah so that's, sick. That's, <laughs> why does that sound like that? What are the chords? Let's let's talk about the chords in that verse. Okay. What, what's going on? Tell us, Adam. Uh, six. Okay, so six major seven. Th this is one of my favorite chords. It's I call it the Isfahan chord, which is the second nice. chord on Duke Ellington's yeah. Isfahan. Nice. Uh, yeah. Wait, what? Wait, I don't get that. Why is it the second? Why Isfahan? Uh, the second. Da -da -da. That chord, that right chord. there. Yeah, so it's a, a jazz standard by Billy Strayhorn for the Duke Ellington Orchestra called Isfahan. And it's the like one of the only times I've ever heard this chord prior to this, which is the six major seven. It's a chord built on the six, but it's just a major seven for some reason. I don't know why. It just is. And it's right there. It's the we're in the key of D, and that's a B major seven chord. Okay, so normally in the key of D, the six chord sounds like this. Right. Right? But, but for, this chord. Is Why this? <laughs> so it takes two two notes, right? Uh, a and D in the key of D would normally be A natural and D natural, but in this chord, it's A sharp and D sharp. So it, it's a lift. It physically is, you yeah. know, you're taking two, and it's this lift, and then you go back. And and you played when when we played that, you played a melody on top of that was like what Bruno was singing, basically. Is that what you played? You, you played you played something. Can you just play whatever you played again yeah. when that chord hits? <laughs> yeah. It was so. I just I just emphasize that seven to be flat. Yes, this is so, going out. Just, yeah, 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 just the rub. So what's so yeah. interesting that, again? Just to, like we're we're even in that first couple, even the first few hits, we're we're used to. That's the tonality we're used to, and then the scale you just played is what? Just uh, just emphasizing that half step. Yeah, just emphasize except half step. Bruno Bruno does like. Bruno, I think uh. I think he touches a G in his little riff on the way down. So it's like. I think. So yeah. already in the first 30 seconds of this performance, that I think that the opening Pharrell thing is different, right? The, the first drum fill is, it's is, a, little, a, is it's a, a bit different. It's a little different. I think there's still the four hits, but... It, the four hits, but... but yeah. But the drum, there's a fill that's not there, in there the... There's more of a fill, yeah. yeah. So, so here's the fill in the live version. Okay, yeah, yeah. Here, here's the studio. Totally different. Different fill. Okay, okay so it's this is, already- This is twice as long. Cut, cut, cut. Yeah, it's a little cut. more active. So it's already announcing like, okay, this is gonna be slightly different than the recording. And then we get the major six chord and everyone's buckling their seatbelts because they know that they're in for some exciting shit. I love that idea of harmony and arranging as production because mm -hmm. like you're telling a very different story here. Uh, one that's necessary for the live per performance, which is, more high energy, less vibey, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, the all the arrangement decisions, that decision to go to that chord out of everywhere is like, it's attention grabbing because mm -hmm. we're not expecting it. And all of a sudden Bruno's literally singing in a different key from where he was singing before. And it's it's just like, you can't help but be like, oh, wow, we're we're in a new world. Yeah. Where, where, where are we going on this the, journey? <laughs> the other thing that I've never really thought about is that the live version the crowd becomes part of the recording. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, 
it's literally, it's an element, it's a huge element of their recording that you have to account for. Jacob, how do you play differently when you're recording in a studio? Yeah. Versus when you're playing out on tour with Kanye or whoever. What what are the differences in the way you actually approach the playing? Uh, I just, I, I throw more paint at the wall with less uh, filter on it. Because I, I still live in this imaginary maybe like world of like, oh, it's the 70s and people aren't filming this, recording this. And I can try doing all of these substitutions and stuff and just like take more risks with, uh, you know, the studio thing. You definitely are like, all right, this is going to be around for a while. Uh, I want to, you know. On a gig like this, what are you given and how much leeway do you have to make it your own? I mean, luckily the hooligans, what, they've been a band for, what, 15? Like, they've been a band for so long and they've, they used to do covers here in the Valley in California and stuff of doing all different songs. So they're like a tried and true band. But, you know, in that video, they're doing, you know, Cameron and Anderson, they're doing total like temptation style dance moves in uniform. And then, like I said, you have Eric and Dwayne in the back doing all the horn parts and all that stuff. So not only are they having to think about the music, they're having to think about this like flawless execution. Because yeah. yes, us as musicians, we're all looking at like listening, okay, is that landing on beat one? Is that doing that? And then there's some dancers that are analyzing it just as, you know, strategy. Right. <laughs> yeah. Is that all on point? Is that all on point? It, it, it really is just like, it's, it's the everything, right? It's, this is you said it, but this is one of the best bands that's playing music right yeah, now. It's a ba it's a band. It's, and a, it's band. a band. It's a band. Yeah. That's, that's the thing that so sets cool it apart. It. It's a is band. a lot of times you go see these shows and there's a bunch of musicians standing on stage that are being paid usually too little mm -hmm. and that are being taken away from their families and it's not their thing. You know what I mean? Like they don't most of the time like it's a gig and they've they don't know that they're, they didn't, you know, grow up playing with this band. They don't know that they're going to be there in two years. So they don't really take ownership for the performance. This feels like a band. This yeah. feels like a group of people that have been in it for, to, for a while together that want to make a great show. And I, one thing I love so much also going back to that is like you have Anderson Pack and the Free Nationals. You have Bruno Mars and the Hooligans. And when you saw Bruno do the Super Bowl, which is like the biggest televised musical performance on the planet, yeah. what did you see? You saw a group of friends dressed exactly the same yeah there's not oh i'm wearing this extra shiny suit and my guys are in the you have this is me this is my friends this is my family and we're all e and that's like going back to the you know james brown the famous flames the, the temptations you know the birds the monkeys you had this beauty in uniformity yeah. of just like this is a team and we're executing together not me here and everyone else like down there totally such a good call out yeah. I, that again that's what it freaking sounds like mm -hmm. it sounds like everybody's on the same team everybody's serving the song it's it's at the end of the day it's like a combination of humility and service to the song right yeah. and yeah. it's like coming from everybody equally it's such a beautiful thing you can i i feel like i can hear it yeah. and, and and even the way, the way you talk about that it's just it just feels like everybody is in it together and another thing i love so much about Silk Sonic and there is like, you know, the lyrics, it, it's serious yes. music. It's kind of like Steely Dan in that sense where it's like, you have very serious music, but they're not taking themselves too seriously. Yes. Like there's something for the musical Michael Jordans and there's something for the musical Danny DeVito's, you yeah. know, there's like, you have the full, like, you know, that, that oh is like, God. you know, I, uh, not to be over dramatic, but I want to die. It's like, that's great. Fun. That's your lyric. Yeah. I, I love um, Chuck E. Cheese, yeah. UFC. <laughs> Yeah. Like, yeah. the words that are coming out of Bruno's mouth are not words that belong in songs. Totally. You know, it's like this smooth major seven, like, you know, sexy thing. And then he's talking about UFC and Chuck E. Cheese, I, which is actually, I like this. These are my favorite lyrics of, of the Silk Sonic project so far because they're fucking, they stick out. They grab you. They're, yeah. they're interesting. They're different. They're not trying to be like, leave the door open. I love the song. I think it's beautiful. I think it's great. But it kind of, the lyrics sort of disappear. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's not about the lyric. Yeah. This is, you cannot not hear yeah. the lyric. Jacob, what, what is the live gig that you've done for the longest? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'll say, I'll say, well, being in Mike Posner's band for the last six years, you know, obviously he had a, a, the number one song like on the planet for a, a minute in 2016. And what was that? I took a pill in Ibiza. That's right. That's yeah, right. yeah. Took a pill in Ibiza to show Avicii I was cool. And uh, one thing I love so much about him is when we did it live, everything was 
you know, he took away all the synths and we tried to be like Dave Matthews band or something. And so he's like, the, the audience and the general public, they know that song, it's on the radio all the time. Yes. So when they come to see us live, they know the point of reference. So let, like you said, it's the contrast of like, when you know what this is and then someone does that, it's like, it's kind of like jazz, right? In like the olden sense of like, oh, this is a standard from the music man. Everyone knows this. And then you hear like Sonny Rollins do Till There Was You. And mm -hmm. then it's like, wow, this is different, but I get what he's doing because I know the original. Yeah, yeah so was, how'd you guys play that song? The single was it very different from the recording? Yeah, I instead of a synth drop, it was a saxophone drop. Yeah, which is yeah, uh, yeah come on, saxophone. Did you play that saxophone drop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that so? If there are thousands of people watching, and yeah. you know the saxophone drop is coming up, and we're a bar away from it. Are you in your head? Are, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Are you nervous? Are you just gonna lay it down? Are you feeling it? What is your like state of yeah. body in that moment? You're definitely, for the live thing, for me, it's just like, I'm gonna try selling this. I'm gonna sell you a bridge that I don't own kind of thing. And I, I know it, you know, you, you may not know what's coming. You may be a little trepidatious about it, but I'm gonna try hitting it as hard as I can to try and win you over. Can you can you play us what you would have played at the at the yeah. drop? Yeah. Like the, like give us a give us a vibe. I would do a lot of like fills. So the, the drop would go. I would do. Like just stuff like that, Variation which time. you could not do on a record, all those little triplets and stuff like that. So, you know, for the live thing, I feel like, yeah, kind of what Adam was talking about. It's just like, you just go for it. Yeah. And you're a little less uh, self-censored. Do you do the same thing every night? No, that's one, that's one thing I guess, and it, it changes with different artists. Some artists want the same kind of, what I call a repeatable offense night yeah. to night. Yeah. And then some artists are very like, well, they kind of get what it is and this is a moment and what happens tonight is tonight and what happens tomorrow in nashville's that and you have to gauge how much freedom you have depending upon the person that you're playing with yeah yeah totally um let's take questions from the youtube community this is uh from fernando bartoloni do you think that this song as well as the whole silk sonic was already conceived as something that would be executed live in big arenas all the songs uh already have a live like feel in my opinion yeah. This is a really interesting point. Yeah. Here we have a band composed of two superstars. They know this shit's going to be massive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like starting a project knowing that it's going to be huge is a whole different thing. Yeah. They they know what the live thing is going to be. They're writing all this stuff yes. knowing that this is going to be on all the award shows and everything. So they they and this is something that like Bruno was was doing beforehand of like doing these crazy intricate live arrangements uh like so this is a, a well-tested formula of like mm -hmm. having the live version and then having the uh the studio version i remember sure. when i was in college i played a lot at this venue the, the coffee house on campus coho the coho and i found myself writing songs for the coho yeah mm -hmm. so like four years later i had this like soft voice like picky quiet guitar kind of thing because i was writing for a coffee shop yeah right. right and so the music that came out of me was like written for that venue mm -hmm. these are songs that are written for fucking arenas like they yeah. are written to be played live and performances like this tv yes, performances and, yes, totally it, it feel like the music videos feel like tv performances from the 60s yes. the 70s you, I, i'm just thinking of like duke ellington wrote for the cotton club yeah Wagner wrote for Beirut great musicians write for spaces mm -hmm. and so i think i think uh i think these guys are writing for, and when bands get stage. huge you hear how their albums change you hear you yeah. two and coldplay writing more simply because mm -hmm. they know there's going to be a five second delay right. the <laughs> i remember there's this um i used to take piano lessons from this incredible jazz piano player taylor Agsty. oh, oh my god hi taylor yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I, know <laughs> I mean dude is a monster on keys yeah. incredible um and I took, I took probably like, I don't know, 10 lessons or something with him. And he told me the story. He was playing at a club once and there was a blind guy in the back of the room, all the way in the back of the room. And sometimes Taylor would be playing and he'd play a lick and the, the, the guy in the back of the room would go, yeah, like that. And Taylor like paused and then he would like keep playing and then he'd like play another thing. And then the guy would be like, yeah. And he'd be like, okay. And then he'd like keep playing. And he said that what he does now is he leaves room for the blind guy. Uh. Like he'll play a thing and then he'll leave space and he like 
writes for the reaction to the audience so people get a time to like let it sink in. Mm -hmm. I feel like actually they're doing that oh, as yeah. well Clearly, here. Yeah. Like they leave some spaces. They know exactly when the crowd's going to cheer. They know yeah. when they cut and he says this bitch, everybody's going to go cr <laughs> like they know when the audience is going to react. And you can only really you can only really do that with experience. That's there's no blueprint yeah. for that. They have the yeah. experience for doing this like it's a band. Like mm -hmm. it's a band, yeah. the choreo, everything. They know it, it, like it's a whole it, like you were saying it was a, it's a whole thing that they know how to do okay yeah. second question is from uh masong masong mason gm mason gm that's <laughs> probably a better way to say it <laughs> mason gm 167 what's the most under <laughs> struggle with that for 30 seconds what's the most underrated element of silk sonic sound that makes them a level above other musicians I'm gonna yes. go. I'm gonna go with their ability to write harmonic changes. Yeah, and I, I'm a I'm a harmony person, Nerd, so I, I'm, a, I, I'm I'm a, I love harmony. <laughs> Nerd. But there's nobody <laughs> writing harmony like this today. Yeah, that's yeah. like pop songs. Like yeah. they're not overdoing yeah. it, but it is so fucking smart. And the the key changes and the little lifts and the way they get to new keys is like beautifully crafted old school harmony. And I, yeah, I, I'm not sure they get enough credit for just the harmonic yeah. genius of the work. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say it's Stevie Wonder is the, like the the, mm -hmm. the blueprint for how you do very smart, very clever, very beautiful harmony in a pop song yes. that really tells yes. a story. Yeah. yeah, and I think Silk Sonic and honestly, like a lot of the stuff that Bruno was doing beforehand, but really culminating in Silk Sonic is like the the spiritual successor to like Stevie Wonder's. Mm -hmm harmonic language yeah. in a way that just like serves the song but just the story is so so detailed and so rich it's interesting that this works so well because it's a caricature of a genre you know what i mean it is it's almost a parody but not it's really. almost a parody yeah. but it's so good you yeah. know what i mean you can't help but like it and have a great time Jacob and Adam, so good. What great guys. guys. Heck yeah. Thank you so Dude. much for coming and, and being on the show with us. We take it out with a little um old, old Donna Lee. What do you guys say? Yeah, Actually, I was hoping Jacob would sign our Oh, we're going to have a little wall signing? Yeah. Ball, uh, did you say Paul Simon? Paul Simon? Paul Simon wall signing? Let's call the Red Diamond Paul Simon. Oh my God. Paul Simon the Red Diamond. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You want to go sign Paul Simon? Yes. That goes perfect with right. I'm going to get a video of you signing the Red Diamond. Do I put my social or my security number? Yeah. Put your credit card. Put your credit card. Put your Venmo in there too. I'm going to do a little thing that I stole from Chris Potter. He uses a little saxophone in his signature. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> I, lo I love you, Chris. I still, I still all your stuff. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Um, and thanks, everybody, for watching, uh, for being here, for leaving comments, for telling us what to review next. If you have suggestions for things that we should listen to, please leave them in the comments below. Guys, play us out. This has been another episode of Professional Musicians React. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Professional guys, <laughs> we're professionals. <Yeah. laughs>